All right, we're going to be going back to Revelation 22 today. Sounds like we have a lot of future preachers in the congregation this morning. Just practicing. Revelation chapter 22. And we are at the end, folks. We should be able to finish, depending on the pastor and the Lord's leading, but we should be able to finish Revelation here this week and next week. You know, in, uh, in J.R.R. Tolkien's most famous work, The Lord of the Rings, in the beginning chapters, one of the central characters, Bilbo, stands up to give a speech at his 111th birthday. And he says these words, It is the end. I must go now. And I kind of get the picture of Jesus Christ standing in heaven next to the throne, waiting for his father to give him the signal and say, it is the end, I must go now, you know. And for us, that's going to be a great day. For those who are not trusting in him as Savior, it's going to be, be the beginning of judgment. But I look forward to that day. And Revelation 22 looks forward to that day as well. And what we have, we finished, as of last week, we have finished the vision of Revelation that John has received of all the things that are future, the, what we call the end times. We've seen the, the tribulation period, we've seen the 1,000-year 1000 1, millennial reign of Christ, and we've seen a glimpse into the eternal kingdom and our eternal home. And so as we embark on this last section of Revelation, this last 16 verses, is kind of the postscript or epilogue of all these visions that John has received about what is coming in the future. And so as we read this, I want you to pay attention to a phrase that is repeated three times over and over and over. And it's Jesus saying, behold, or lo, I come quickly. That is the focus of the rest of this passage. So let's read this passage together. And you can follow along as I read. We're going to start at verse 6 and read through the rest of the chapter this morning. So Revelation 22, verse 6, the Bible says, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then he said unto me, See that thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. And he said unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust... Let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, And may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angels to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book." He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let's take a minute and pray before we embark on this passage. Our Father, again, in worship we come before you. 
In submission, we bow at your throne, and now in submission, we present ourselves to the authority of your word. Lord, we want to be taught, we want to be molded into the likeness of Jesus Christ. We want to live lives that are pleasing in your sight. And Lord, through your teaching, we will learn, we will be changed. And so, Lord, may your spirit do his work in each one of us. May we be willing to sacrifice our own wants and desires so that we can accept the truth that you have today and become that person that you want us to be. But, Lord, teach us through your word now. I pray that you would just help me. I'm just a man, a ball of dust, weak in everything, and yet, Lord, you can speak through me. So fill me with your spirit, I pray. Help us to be able to hear your word Proclaim boldly through your strength and through your spirit. May we all be taught and challenged today. And may you be glorified in this time through all that's said and done. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as I mentioned, as we get to verse 6 of chapter 22 in Revelation, this is the epilogue, the postscript, the conclusion of everything that we've been studying through this book. Now, we saw at the very beginning of the book, we saw Jesus glorified by his Father revealing himself to John. That was chapter 1. And now Jesus is waiting for the time to be announced for his return and for, his, for the time to, for him to come and get his bride, and that's us, the church. And with that coincides the time when Jesus will open the scroll that contains the judgments that will be poured out upon the earth. And so when we go up to heaven, that sets in motion all of these things that we've been studying in Revelation. We've read about the con- con- commendations and the condemnations in chapters 2 and 3 of those churches. Now, those seven churches were real churches, but they represent churches throughout all of history. The last church was the church of Laodicea. That represents the time that we are in now. Lackadaisical apathetic, cold, as far as God is concerned. That is the age in which we live, and that's the last church. And when we get through this period, then Christ will return, and the revelation uh, from chapter 6 on will start at that point. But we've been given a detailed description of the judgments of God upon the earth, the reign of Antichrist that will happen during the seven years of the tribulation. We're told of the second coming of Christ at the end of those seven years, and his conquest over his enemies, and then he will set up his 1,000-year millennial reign on earth, which we will be a part of, and we will reign with him. And then we got to chapter 21 and 22, and we were introduced to the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, which will be at the center of it all, our new eternal home that Christ is preparing for us. And we see all of that in detail, and that's what we have to look forward to where we will dwell with God in person forever. That's our future, and that's our hope. And so all through this book, we've been told what is going to come. Now, these things are not fairy tales. This is not some idea that's interesting. It's not science fiction that becomes the script for some movie. This is the truth, folks. This is what God promises will happen in the future. It may begin today. It may begin 10 years from today or 50 years from today. We don't know. But like I said at the beginning, Jesus is standing in heaven waiting for his father to give him the signal that it's time to get his bride. And when he comes to get his bride, that is the beginning of the end of life on this earth. And so we need to be preparing for what happens after life after this, or life after this life on this earth. So as we reach this final portion of the book, given all that information about what is to come, there's an emphasis, and you saw that, there's an emphasis on the return of Jesus Christ. Now, again, the central message of the book of Revelation is not all the details of what's going to happen in the end times, what's the tribulation going to be like, what's the Antichrist going to be like, what is the millennial kingdom going to be like, what is heaven and eternity going to be like. Okay, those are given to us, but the central focus comes down to the glory of God. Seeing all of this stuff and through all of these events, God is magnified and glorified. 
because he's a perfect God. He's a perfect and holy and just God. And through the blessings that he bestows upon those who believe in him, he is glorified. And through the judgments that he executes against the wicked in those times, he is justified. As he destroys evil for the final time, he is justified and he is glorified. And so it's all about the glory of God, and we can't miss that point. And over and over, what we've seen is the, the, the testimony of those who have been saved, those who have been redeemed, bowing at the throne of God, claim, proclaiming his glory, proclaiming that he is worthy to receive worship. And so that's Revelation. That's the focus of Revelation. And that's what the conclusion here gives us, is a picture of Jesus Christ ready to come back. But in that picture, he says three times, Behold, I come quickly. Now, when he says that phrase, Behold, I come quickly, the word quickly there in the Greek is tachu, not a sneeze, by the way. It's tachu, T-A-C-H-U in English, okay? But that word quickly indicates both the speed with which it will happen and the fact that it will be very soon or before too long. When Christ returns at the rapture, the Bible tells us that it will be in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15. In the twinkling of an eye, it's going to happen. Okay, now scientists have tried to explain that. What is the twinkling of an eye? Well, it's faster than a blink. It's kind of like light reflecting off the lens of your eye and how fast that happens. One commentator said, I want you to put this in perspective. Of all the other parts of your body, your eye is the part that moves the fastest. Okay, so the twinkling of an eye is an instant, suddenly. That's the word we can use for suddenly. Okay, all of a sudden it, it happens. And we're not going to have time to prepare. It's not like we're going to be there and, oh, look, Jesus is coming. Uh, yeah, that's time to pack up and get ready, right? No, it's not going to happen that way. When he decides to come, it's going to be, bam, and it's over. There are going to be people who are looking for his coming, who are just going to be going about their everyday lives, and the next moment, they'll be in the clouds with our Lord. Okay, that's what we look forward to, but that's what it means when it says, Quickly, there's no time for anybody to prepare. It's not like we have any warning. All of a sudden, Jesus is going to be given the word by his Father, and he's here, and we're gone. So it happens quickly, incredibly fast, but it will also happen soon. Okay, now, the church has been looking forward to this event, and I'm talking about the rapture, okay, because that's what sets in motion all of these events of Revelation. But Jesus will come to claim his church, his bride from the earth. And the church, since the inception of the church, way back in Acts chapter 2, 2,000 years ago, okay, they have been looking forward to this event. Even in the time of the disciples and the apostle Paul. And we think, man, that was a long time ago. How could they have expected Jesus to return that soon since he was ready to go to heaven or he'd just gone to heaven? Well, actually, in Acts chapter 1, we read about the ascension of Jesus Christ. All right? Acts 1 is not after Jesus left. Acts 1 is while Jesus is still on earth with his disciples. And the disciples are actually asking Jesus in Acts chapter 1, after he rises from the tomb, before he goes back to heaven, and they say, so are you going to establish your kingdom now? You've died. You've conquered death. You've come back to life. We're ready, right? Let's do the kingdom now. The disciples thought it was going to happen. Uh, Acts 1 says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore thy kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So the disciples were looking for this kingdom before Jesus even went back to heaven. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, Paul commends the Corinthian believers because they're eagerly awaiting what he calls the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he wasn't talking about the book of Revelation. That wasn't written yet. What he was talking about was the revealing of Jesus Christ when he came back to earth. Okay, 
And the, the Corinthian believers in Paul's day were looking forward to that. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 4 or 5, Paul says this, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will, bring, who will bring to light hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. So he says it's coming. Don't start judging things and looking at things and say, Oh, it must be now. Oh, it must be now. He says, just be ready. Jesus is going to come back, and when he comes back, he'll take care of all that stuff. He's going to take care of all the hidden thoughts of the evil in people's hearts. You stop worrying about it. He says he's going, to, he's going to judge the wicked. He's going to bless the good. You just be ready for his coming. At the end of 1 Corinthians, in, ver, in chapter 16, verses 20, verse 22, Paul actually uses the Aramaic word Maranatha. Now, you may recognize that word, okay? But that word is literally Aramaic. It's transliterated directly into our language. That word Maranatha means, O Lord, come. That's the translation of the word. And apparently, at this time period, when Paul is writing this book to the Corinthians, this word Maranatha had become a very popular and familiar byword that people would say to each other and say in their prayers. And so they would pray, Maranatha, O Lord, come, because they were looking forward to that day when Christ would return. In uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, Paul wrote to the Macedonian believers. These are mostly Gentiles. And he says, For our conversation or our life is in heaven, from whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And Paul's obviously referring to, to the incorruptible body we will receive when we go up to heaven with Jesus Christ. Okay, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul discusses the rapture of the church. And these are this is a famous passage along with 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul's talking about the rapture when Christ will return from heaven with a shout and the dead in Christ shall rise first, he says. And then he uses these words. We, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with the Lord. We, Paul, is writing, we. He included himself. So he was looking forward to Christ coming back, maybe in his lifetime. He said the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now he's talking about dying there. He says, not all of us are going to die before Christ comes back, and he's going to take some of us up alive. And he said, we, including himself. So Paul even had this idea that the Lord's return could be at any moment, in his lifetime possibly. So the believers of Paul's day and John's day, when these things were written that we have in Scripture, they were expecting Jesus to return then. And so they were ready. James chapter 5, verse 9 James was the half-brother of Christ. He was the elder in the church of Jerusalem, and he wrote this, the judge stands before the door. He was speaking of Jesus Christ, the great judge that we read about in, in Revelation. He is the great judge who alone is worthy to open the seals of the scroll and carry out all these judgments that we see in the book of Revelation. And James, when he wrote that, he said he stands at the door. He's ready to come. He's ready to begin this. And now here we are. 2,000 years later, and Jesus hasn't come back. And there are people, and I've talked to a few, and there are people like, well, you know, Jesus said he was going to come back, and they expected him back then, and he hasn't come yet. No, it's just a big fairy tale. No. The fact that Jesus hasn't come back just means this. We're closer to it today than we were yesterday. We're closer to it today than we were in Paul's day and in John's day. So it could happen at any moment. And that's what he means when the Lord says, Behold, I come quickly. It's going to happen very soon. Now, it may not be in our lifetime. It may be after some of us are dead. It may be 100 years from now. I don't know. It could be now. Okay, I was wrong about that. That's why I don't predict things, okay? But it's soon. It's going to be soon. Jesus said that. Behold, I come quickly. It's going to be in an instant, and it could be at any moment. And we need to keep that in mind. And that is 
the substance of the message that he gives in the end of chapter 22 of Revelation here, the very end of Scripture, in fact. This is the last message we read in all of God's Word. And so he's emphasizing this point, behold, I come quickly. And so we as believers there should look at this with expectation, but also a sense of urgency that as we look around in our lives and as we live our lives, there are still so many people around us that have no hope of Jesus coming back. In fact, when Jesus comes back, that's going to be the beginning of their judgment on this earth and eventually eternal judgment in hell if they do not submit to him as Lord and Savior. And so how many people do we want that we see every day to miss the rapture, to have to go through the judgments of the tribulation, possibly to go through eternal judgment in hell? Do we really wish that upon people? And if Jesus could return at any moment and that's the end, what are we doing today? How urgent is it for us to share that truth that can save so many people? And so with that foundation of Jesus' imminent return established here, he gives us three messages built on that foundation. We're not going to get to all three this morning. But the first one is the verification of his word. He says, what I have said will happen. It's not a fairy tale. It's not made up things. It's not just a nice story. These are true and faithful words. So he verifies his word. Through this message, he also then, secondly, gives an invitation to all those who will come to him and partake of the tree of life, the river of life, all the blessings that he has promised to those who believe. And then with that invitation, he also gives a warning, and that's the third message, that even though this invitation is to all, that all those who ignore that invitation and do not take Christ at his word will be condemned in their sin forever. And that's how the Bible ends. And he says, behold, I come quickly. So I want to take this morning and for a few minutes and just look at the verification of his word. And it starts in verse 6, very first things that he says to us, or the angel actually says, these sayings are faithful and true. What sayings? Well, everything written in this book, because it all is the word of God, but specifically all the things that we read about in Revelation. It is the Word of God. Now, this statement is a repetition of what we read back in chapter 21 and verse 5. And the angel's telling John to keep, continue to write all these things that he's seeing. And at the end of verse 5, he says, write, write these things, for these words are true and faithful. These will take place. It is the Word of God. There's no doubt that this is going to happen. So this, faithful, this phrase, faithful and true, appears earlier in Revelation, but it also appears twice in Revelation, in chapter 3 and in chapter 19, as a title for the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the one who is faithful and true. So we know that what he says is going to come to pass because it's the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the true and faithful one. And the angel emphasizes here that everything that's been revealed to John in these visions will come to pass in a literal manner in exactly the way God has expounded them right here through the messenger. That's exactly what John says at the beginning of this passage. If you continue reading, it says, These things are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which what? Which must shortly be done. They're going to happen soon. And they're going to happen. There's no doubt about it. See, the book of Revelation, especially as we started and began chapter 6, and then we read up through chapter 18. Okay, that is the tribulation. We know that's going to come to pass. And then we read about the millennial kingdom. And then we read about the eternal kingdom, the new creation. We read about all that. That, that is reality of our future. And so we know all of that will come to pass. Why? Because it's in the Bible. Well, that doesn't matter. What matters is what the Bible is. 
The Bible is the word of God. It is the words of God to us. And so if God has spoken those words, then we can be sure that they will come to pass. And that's exactly how John starts this. And the angel's message to him is, you don't have to doubt anything that I've given you. All this vision is not just a vision. It's not a TV show. It's not a movie. It's not just some imaginary thing. It is real life that will happen, and you can count on that because it's the words of Jesus Christ, the true and faithful one. Now, I wish we treated the rest of Scripture like that, right? When Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you, do you believe that's absolutely true and he is the true and faithful one? It will never happen that he will leave you or forsake you. When he says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory, do you count on that being absolutely true or do you doubt that? And when he says, those who come to me in faith, confessing their sins, they shall be saved. All those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you believe that is absolutely true? Or do you doubt? Well, you know, maybe he did. Maybe, I don't know. It's the word of God. Because it's the word of God, because it's the words of Jesus Christ, there is no doubt that they will be fulfilled. And that's what John says right at the beginning. The angel tells John this. These things must be come to pass from the rise of the antichrist to the judgment of god on the earth from the destruction of all the wicked people and the binding of satan at the second coming of christ to the 1000 literal literal reign of christ on earth and then followed by the great revolt when satan is loosed and god and christ destroys all of the wicked and sends all of them to the lake of fire for eternity and then we have eternity with jesus christ and the new creation it's all true. And they must come to pass because they are the words of Jesus Christ. Now, the angel says here, these things have been sent by God, or the angel has been sent by God to show unto his servants those things which must shortly be done. The word servants here is the same word we read in verse 3. Bond servants, those servants of God. Remember in verse 3, it's talking about we shall serve him in eternity. In the eternal kingdom, we will be serving Jesus Christ. And here he says this message is given, is shown to, revealed to, if you will, his servants. Now, have you ever met somebody, maybe it's an unbeliever, and you try to talk about Revelation, and they're like, you believe that stuff? Are you kidding me? That is so far-fetched, it wouldn't even make a good science fiction movie. Okay? I've had this conversation with people. They're not going to get it. The Bible tells us that the um, unrighteous person cannot understand the truth of God because they don't have the Holy Spirit. See, it's the Holy Spirit in us as believers. He is the one that teaches us these things that are true. And so we learn to understand them. We learn how they apply to us, and we accept them as true because we are his servants. And that's what John says. These things are given to his servants, because these things must shortly come to pass. They must shortly be done. They're going to make sense to those, and they're going to be a blessing, actually, to those people who are Christ's servants. And he's showing them to us because they involve us. And it's not going to be long before we're going to be in the middle of it. In verse 7, Jesus says, that based on the promise of Jesus coming, the blessing will be for those who do what? Who take heed, who do the things written in this book, whose robes are washed in the blood, is literally how that phrase reads. Okay? He says in verse 7, Blessed, behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book, or whose robes are washed in the blood of Christ. Now, those are redeemed believers. Those are the ones that are going to receive the blessing. Now, way back, and if you remember, I should give you the quiz just to see how much you've learned. But way back in chapter 1, I told you, as we get into Revelation, there's seven beatitudes of Revelation, or seven blesseds. This here in verse 7 is the sixth of those seven blesseds. We have two in this last passage. But those blesseds, or blessed is the one, the blessings are promised for those people who have submitted to Jesus Christ, who are his servants. And it says, blessed is, are those 
who hear and do these things. We have the same thing in chapter 1, verse 3. The, the book of Revelation opens this way. It says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And then here in verse 7, it's a repetition. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. So there's blessing to those who are his servants. There's blessing to those who understand what all this is talking about. There's blessing to those who believe these are the words of Jesus Christ and they will come to pass. And this blessing to the blessed ones refers to the hope that we will be spared the wrath of God that will take place on this earth, but eventually in eternity, and will be given the blessing of being with him in person, not just in the millennial kingdom, but forever. We avoid wrath. We receive Jesus Christ. That's the blessing. All the good things, all the blessings that we've read about in Revelation will be ours. And all the judgments we will avoid. But for those who refuse to be Christ's servants in this life, they will not be spared the judgment either on this earth or in the life thereafter. So this blessed or blessing is given to his servants, to the ones who will do, not just hear, not just know, but those who do the things that are written in this book. Now, that's an overwhelming message for John. You think about John, I mean, he's 2000, almost 2,000 years ago, receiving this from an angel, seeing this almost in person for him. It's like a personal experience for him, and he's recording all of this for us. And the angel tells him, well, the angels and say, it's Jesus Christ here. Behold, I come quickly. It's going to happen soon. And blessed are those who will keep all these things, who trust that these are going to be true, and they live accordingly. And John is overwhelmed. And so in verse 8, it says, I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Amazing. I mean, Think about him standing in the presence of an angel, receiving the, the prophecy from God himself, seeing all these things that are going to come to pass. And then Jesus himself said, blessed are those people, including you, John, who keep these things. And John is overwhelmed, and he bows down at the feet of the angel, telling him this message, and he starts to worship. And honestly, it would be for us, in comprehending our part in this, if, if this was us receiving, I think... Maybe we would have the same response. But what John is receiving is the word of God. It's given to him for his own admonition, for his own encouragement. But I want, you, I want to put you in, in John's mindset right now. Because John here, receiving this news about the blessing of those who do the things that are written in the book of God, those who heed to God's word, blessing comes with it. And upon hearing that, immediately does the opposite, okay? He bows down and worships the angel. Now, he probably was just so overwhelmed that, you know, here's the messenger of God. And that's his natural response. He bows down and starts to worship at the feet of the angel. And the angel tells him, don't do that. First Peter, let me get you in, my, in, in John's mindset. First Peter chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. Peter says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Now I want you to remember back in Revelation 2 and 3. Remember there's the commendations. Jesus said the things they were going to be blessed for because they were doing well. But then he gave warnings because there were a lot of things that he condemned in the churches. And several times he mentions this idea of idolatry and false worship. He condemns the churches for that. And so Peter says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin with us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? Well, <laughs> Revelation answers that question. In verse 18 in 1 Peter 4, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Peter says the righteous scarcely shall be saved. That means we get in by the skin of our teeth, not because of what we've done, 
But Peter's statement here about the righteous being scarcely saved, he's saying that salvation and redemption comes at great expense and great difficulty, and it's only accomplished through the God that is our judge. Put yourself in John's mindset and put yourself in in the mindset we should have as believers. If you had to stand before God and answer for your life and all the things that you have done, all of them, and God is a righteous and perfect judge and cannot overlook sin, where would we all be? In hell. There's no other choice for a righteous and perfect judge than to condemn us for our sin because we're all guilty. And yet, we are looking forward to the future that we see in these last couple of chapters of Revelation, even though we don't deserve it, because our righteous judge has carried out our sentence for us and instead giving us blessing in him instead of condemnation. And we don't deserve it. If God's justice overruled his mercy, we'd all be condemned to death. But he has mercy. If God's mercy overruled his justice, then everybody would go into heaven, and that would bring sin into heaven, and everybody would, it would all be corrupted. So God couldn't do that either. But God's holy, and holiness, as I explained before, is that all of his virtues, his justice, his judgment, his mercy, his love, everything about him is perfect. It's in the right, I don't even want to use the word balance, it's complete. Everything about God is complete, perfect. His judgment is perfect, his justice is perfect, his mercy is perfect, his his righteousness is perfect. Everything about him is in perfect balance, and they all balance each other out. So the righteous judge has given us an opportunity to experience the blessings of heaven that we could never deserve, we could never earn, we can't even come close to claiming them, and yet that's exactly where we are because we have a God who loves us and executes mercy and righteousness, and therefore justice and mercy have kissed each other, the psalmist says. But Jesus said that if you were to be a follower of him, it wasn't going to be easy, right? He said, the world's going to hate you just as they hated me. Expect persecution. Expect, he told his disciples, expect to be put to death because you are a believer. And so the life that he calls us to in mercy is not an easy one. And so it's going to require a willingness for us to suffer, for us to be persecuted, a a sacrifice, a willingness to be humbled and humiliated for the name of Jesus Christ. And that's not a very appealing prospect for many people. And because of that, Jesus said there's going to be very few who find that straight way and enter into that narrow gate. And in our own human strength, we could not persevere in our faith, even if we tried to. And so it's all about God in our lives. He redeemed us. He saved us. He continues to sustain us. He continues to teach us, to bring us along in this life, to help us to persevere so that we can look forward to the blessing. And as John realizes how close he came, as we should, how close he came to being one of those who were going to end up in eternal fire... And yet God saved him from that. His natural response is just to fall down and worship the messenger that's bringing him this message of blessing. Now, there's an irony here because it says that the blessing will be for those who keep Christ's words. And here, John engages in false worship and idolatry immediately after receiving the blessing of those who obey Christ. He's already been told once in the course of these visions back in chapter 19 not to worship angels. He did this before, okay? When he was shown the marriage supper of the Lamb, it says he falls down at the feet of the angel. The angel then tells him, don't worship me, worship God. And he is the one chosen by God here to receive all of these amazing revelations about the future of the church and the future of the world and the future blessing that is coming through Jesus Christ. And he's overwhelmed correctly by the majesty and glory of our Lord, and yet his worship goes awry, even though he 
was sincere in trying to worship the Lord, his worship is wrong. And this is not uncommon for worship of the true God, either now or before. You go all the way back to Israel. God brought them out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, destroyed the Egyptians. They landed at Mount Sinai. They camped there for two years. Moses goes up into the mountain to receive the law of God, the Ten Commandments specifically, but then all the laws that come with it. And while he's up there, the Israelites get impatient. And what do they do? They want to worship. And so they persuade Aaron to build this golden calf. And in Exodus 32, the Bible says, And all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Here's our God. This is the God that brought us out of Egypt. They weren't talking about a false God. Now, they fashioned it in the fashion of a false God of Egypt, but they were talking about the God that brought them out of Egypt. In fact, in the next verse, verse 5, it says, And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Talking about Almighty God. And so they were trying in a feeble way, in their own way, to worship the God who brought them out of Egypt, and yet they violated the very command that Moses was bringing down from the mountain that said, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. And John does the same thing. Even though they were sincere in their worship, it was carried out in the form of idolatry. And Israel struggled with this throughout their entire history. True worship of God does not involve idols or statues or saints or angels. True worship of God is worship of God alone. The angel makes that very clear. We don't sing to dead people or pray to dead people. We don't sing to inanimate objects or pray to inanimate objects. We don't sing to live people or pray to live people, I hope. And and we don't pray or sing to angels, okay? Worship must be directed to God alone. And it matters how we do that, because many times as humans we think, well, I'm going to worship God, but I'm going to do it in my own way, and we end up in false worship and idolatry, just like John does here because he worships at the foot of an angel instead of worshiping God himself. So the angel admonishes John here right away, and he says, don't do that. Don't worship the messenger. And the angel says, I'm just a fellow servant, just like you, just like the prophets before you. I'm just the messenger, which is an interesting thing for the angel to say, because in Psalm 8 and in Hebrews 2, it's repeated in Hebrews 2, the Bible tells us that man was created by God to be a little lower than the angels. In other words, in God's hierarchy of creation, angels, man, we are below them. And so in our minds we think, well, then maybe it was appropriate for John to worship the angel. No. It doesn't matter where we are in the hierarchy. The only one that is to be worshipped is the one at the top. So even though angels are above us, and have authority over us, literally given to them by God, and we are under them in the hierarchy of creation. They do not deserve our authority, our worship. And that's why the angel tells John, I'm just a messenger, just like you, just like the prophets. I'm just a messenger. Don't worship the messenger. Worship the God who sent the messenger. And I think that's a great lesson for us to remember today. Don't worship the messengers. There's a great many good preachers and teachers out there. You can hear them on the radio. You can watch them on TV. You can read their books. They, there are commentaries. There's devotionals. There's inspirational books. You can pick them up. You can watch them. You can hear, listen to them. And I'm not saying don't. Okay, We can learn a lot from them. I do. All right? I, I listen to sermons, and I watch people preach, and I read books every week. But none of them should take the place of Jesus Christ as the one we're following. We should not be a disciple of some great teacher. We should not be a disciple of some great author. And when we go to to try to understand truth, 
How much time do we spend listening to them and reading their books as compared to reading the word of God and spending time with him? And if all of our so-called worship is directed toward men's stuff, men's preaching, men's writing, men's commentaries even, if that's the bulk of our worship, we've got a problem because we are to worship God. And to worship God, we need to know what he says, not what somebody else thinks he says. We need to receive it directly from him. And that's the importance of having the word in our life and saturating ourselves with this book because these are the words of God and these will come to pass. Now, in studying for this message, I probably read 13 or 14 different books and commentaries. I listened to two messages online, okay? It was to help me to get a sense of, all right, what, is, what do other teachers think this is talking about? What do other teachers believe? I didn't then take their message and go, oh, well, that's good. i got to write that down. Oh, that's good. i got to write that down, okay? That's to help me understand, but I spent a whole lot more time praying about and reading through this passage of Scripture than I did with other people because God is the one. The Holy Spirit brings us into all truth. He uses other people to help us to get there, but his truth is here. These are the things that will come to pass. These are the things that are faithful and true, not somebody's commentary, not somebody's inspirational devotional. This is the absolute true word of God. And so we cannot replace this with somebody else's book. We cannot replace the worship of God by watching somebody else preach on TV. We must enter into his presence ourselves. And I appreciate the good comments and the gratitude that you guys expressed to me in response to my teaching. You know, I, I love to teach God's word, okay? And I'm glad that you get a blessing out of it. But I don't want people to fall in love with my teaching. I want them to fall in love with the one who I'm teaching about, with our Lord. That's why I'm here. So don't look at me and think, oh, this is a great pastor. Okay, forget that. We have a great Lord. And I'm just a servant, just like the angel, just the messenger that God has sent to share this truth with you. And we're all in this together. So don't worship pastors or teachers or books or commentaries. Worship God. And that's what the angel says here to John. Don't worship me, the messenger. Worship the one who sent me. Worship God. And in verse 10, the angel says to John, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He tells John that even though he might be overwhelmed by all of this that he sees in this vision and the message that he contains, it's not to be kept a secret. Now, this is in direct contrast to the vision that Daniel receives in his time. In fact, in Daniel chapter 12, the angel tells Daniel, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. And in verse 9 of that chapter, he says, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So what's the difference? Why is John told, don't seal this up? Everybody needs to see it. But Daniel's told the same stuff, by the way. Daniel's visions are about the Antichrist, the end times, the tribulation. Okay, Very much similar to what we read in Revelation. And yet the angel tells Daniel, seal it up, don't share this. And John, he says, don't seal it up. Everybody needs to see this. Think about who John's writing to. This is for the church, right? Starts by addressing the churches. So this is for the church. It's given to us. John's writing in the church age. He's writing to the churches. And it's relevant for us because Jesus could come back at any moment. And so from the very inception of the church in Acts chapter 2 until 2022 today, it's relevant to all of us. There's no reason to seal it up. Daniel's vision, on the other hand, was written 2,500 years ago, about 450 years before Christ was born. And in that point, Israel had rejected God's law. That's why they were in exile in the first place. And then 450 years later, they reject the Messiah that God sends as part of that revelation in Daniel. And God told Daniel that would happen. And at that point, God pushed the pause button on his direct intervention in the lives of the Jews and established the church age. 
and he's focused his attention on the church at this point in history for the last 2,000 years to make his people jealous because they're missing out on his blessing and his attention. And when Christ comes back at the rapture, now the church is removed, and God again focuses on Israel and says, okay, now you've seen what can happen if you follow me. You've seen the blessing that it will give to the people who follow me. Are you ready to come back? And the Bible tells us that the seven years of tribulation is for the purging of Israel. It's to weed out sin, and in the end, the remnant of Israel, all Israel who are Israel, will be saved. And they will go into the millennial kingdom with Christ. So Daniel's prophecy won't make sense to Jews until they get to the tribulation period. And then, all of a sudden, it's going to make sense. And that's why the angel told Daniel, seal it up until the end. That's the end. But this prophecy in Revelation is for the church. And the purpose for this revelation is to reveal God's plan for us for the future. And he says, for those who come to Christ, for those who are his servants, those who are overcomers, we are shown the judgment that the wicked will receive. We will see the judgment that we will avoid and the blessings that God has for us instead. But the wicked are also going to see what they're in for. And so it's all there. And we can be sure that everything that God says will come to pass because these words are faithful and true. So we all need to hear this, these things that John has written for us. Revelation is not some obscure book that you, don't, you should only go to when you, you don't care what you read or you need something to fall asleep to because you can't understand it. Revelation is God's revealing the truth of what our future is going to be, one way or the other. And it will come to pass. Why? Look at the end of verse 10. Because the time is at hand. It could happen at any moment. What time? The time of Jesus' return, the rapture of the church, his taking of his bride to heaven, and the beginning of all of these things we read in Revelation. The time is near, the time is at hand for Jesus to return. Now, his return to rapture again is the beginning of all of, Revel all of what we read in Revelation. That, that is the signal. When is that going to happen? I don't know. When God turns to Jesus and says, it's time, go claim your bride, it's going to happen like that. But Jesus tells us that time is at hand. Not tomorrow, not the next day, it's at hand. It could be right now. It could be tomorrow. We don't know. But the time is at hand. And that means that anyone hearing the words in this book had better be ready because if you're not ready, you know what you're in for. If we are ready, we also know what we're going to receive. And that's the blessing. We know because Jesus said all of these things must come to pass. His words are faithful and true because he is the true and faithful one. And once it begins, it's too late to turn back. You don't get a second chance. And that brings us to the invitation and the warning that begins in verse 11. We're going to stop there because I don't have time to get into that today. We'll look at the invitation and the warnings, but Jesus invites all who would partake of life to come to him. And then he warns all those who reject him. This is the judgment that's coming. And so... As we close today, I just want to go back to that beginning message, that message that you see all through this passage. Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. The time is at hand. He is coming. Could be soon. It could be today. It could be before you walk out the doors of this church. And the only question that matters is not is what heaven going to be like. How close am I going to get to sit to Jesus? The question is, are you ready when Christ returns? Are you ready 
when all of this begins, because we know it will. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for your word. We thank you that you do challenge us, even in our Christian walk. And as Peter has told us, seeing that all these things are going to be dissolved in fervent heat, this world, the life that we have now, it's all going to be destroyed. What manner of persons ought we to be? Lord, I pray that you would help us to see the importance of your truth, that we know it is true, and that we would make it the foundation of how we live, looking forward to the return of Christ, when you will reward us for our obedience, for our faithfulness. But Lord, we can't do it without you. So help us not to question, help us to trust in faith, to faithfully serve you, to continue on in perseverance, knowing that at the end there is greater blessing than we could have here, because you are the true and faithful one. Thank you again for your mess- the message that you've given us today. In the truth of your word, may we be challenged by it, may we be comforted by it, and encouraged to continue on in faith. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.